Hello students, and welcome to your first lecture for CORE 201. Today we're going to get right down to it, and we're going to talk about the United States Constitution. Uh, we're going to talk about where it came from, who wrote it, why they wrote it, and then we're going to go through each part of the Constitution and talk about why it's important. So this is how we're going to start the class, uh, because the class itself will be focused on why we wrote this the way that we did, where we got these ideas, uh, who we outright stole them from. Uh, so the best place to start is at the end, and then we'll work our way back to the beginning. So let's get started. The first thing to do is to kind of set the stage. So if you can imagine, uh, it was like the mid 1700s. Uh, America was made up essentially of 13 colonies that belonged to Britain and then several other colonies that belonged to France and Spain. And then let's never forget all of the other people who were already here. So when we're talking about what America looked like at this point in history, we're pretty much just on the East Coast, and it's a really vibrant community. There's a lot of trade, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of uh, manufacturing, there's a lot of growth in regard to farming. So the American colonists were actually kind of rich. They were doing like a really good job making their own money, and that's the main reason they didn't want to stay colonized by Britain. They wanted to retain all of their own wealth because it was going pretty well over here. Another thing to remember is that the Constitution was written for way fewer people than we have now. There were probably about 2.4 million colonists that were living in the 13 colonies up and down the East Coast at this point. Right now in Atlanta, for reference, there's about 5 million people. So who the Constitution was written for is a way different population than what we have right now. And that is important to think about. The final thing to think about in regard to when the Constitution was written is that it was written during a time when monarchy was still the main way that people governed themselves. And the writers of the Constitution really wanted to avoid that because they'd seen it go really badly, especially in Britain where they had King George III who was fine but not that great, perhaps mentally ill. Uh, they'd seen it go badly in France where they put a five-year-old on the throne right before all of this happened. So one of the main things that was happening was that the men who wrote the Constitution were kind of looking around the world and thinking to themselves, you know what, maybe monarchy is not the way to go. So next, let's talk about who wrote the Constitution. And who wrote it is kind of up for decision, um, in large part because they just outright stole parts of it, which we'll talk about. But basically, we give most of the credit to Madison and Jefferson, a little bit to Payne, a lot to John Locke. Uh, George Washington was there, but he didn't do much. But the thing that's really interesting about the guys that wrote the Constitution is that by and large, they were young and they were reckless and they were pretty drunk. Uh, we think of them, I think, so often as old guys in powdered wigs, like old white men, you know, the founding fathers. But really, they were kind of radical. Uh, the idea that they would start a revolution was itself radical. They were incredibly well educated, especially for the time. So when we look back at the men who wrote the Constitution, it's like on the one hand, there were these elite demigods, and on the other hand, there were these like drunken, rebellious young dudes. So the guys who wrote the Constitution were complex, and that's important to remember. So basically, it was a group effort. Um, a lot of people got together to help write the Constitution at the Constitutional Convention. So this was in Philadelphia, and it was in the summer, which was a terrible idea, because Philadelphia is basically a swamp. Uh, and they basically got together for a couple of weeks and just tried to hammer it out. Uh, like all group projects, mostly it was done by one person, that person was James Madison. Um, but basically they got together and they debated all the different parts over the course of that really long, hot summer. So there were a lot of people involved in the writing of the Constitution, but we still really only look back on it being the work of primarily four or five men, and then everybody else just voted on what they wrote down. The next question is why we wrote it. So basically, we needed unification. Uh, we had all of these colonies, but they were all really, really spread out, and we hadn't decided the best way to all get along to achieve social order. Um, so we had the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union of the States, et cetera, et cetera. It has a beautiful title. Um, but the Articles of Confederation were more of like an outline, sort of like a sketch for how to get along. They had a really weak central government. And one of the things that had happened was that we needed a slightly stronger central government, especially in regard to people traveling back and forth between the states. So at this point, uh, we had the Articles of Confederation and we had our Declaration of Independence, but what we needed was one massive unifying document that would apply to absolutely everybody. So essentially, they had to get together and write like one big masterpiece, and maybe they did. We'll talk about it. Before we really dig into the Constitution, we do have to talk about the Declaration just for a second. We'll get more into the Declaration later, but 
we have to remember the very, very first line, which basically sets the path for America. So I'm sure that you know it, but basically it goes, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created with unalienable rights. So basically, there's a few important things in this first sentence. Uh, one, that all men are created with these rights. There's an asterisk next to all, because we know they didn't mean all, but again, we'll talk about it. Uh, the second is that people have rights, uh, and that these rights are unalienable. So every single human born has these rights, and you cannot take them away. And the third thing are the rights that they listed, which are fascinating. They decided on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So one of the first things we'll talk about this semester is this idea of the pursuit of happiness and what that means. You'll notice we're not promised happiness. We are promised the pursuit, the opportunity to like try to find happiness, try to make happiness. But we are definitely promised life, we're not going to kill you, liberty, we're not going to imprison you, and the right to try to be happy. So I want you to keep those things in mind as we start to unpack the Constitution itself, because that very first sentence of the Declaration pretty much tells us what we need to know about what they wanted America to be. So the Constitutional Convention went on all summer in Philadelphia in 1787. Bear in mind, Philadelphia was the capital of the time. And it was attended by pretty much all the people they thought were important, uh, definitely like the heads of each of the states, but also some of the people who had been fundamental to the whole revolution in the first place. So I wanted to show you this painting. There's a couple of really great paintings um, of the convention. They're all highly inaccurate because, of course, who cares? Uh, but I wanted to show you this one in particular because I love it so much. So as you can see in this painting, the light focuses on the people that we believe to be most important. So you can see George Washington standing up there. He's the tallest. He's the best lit. And this is a really interesting choice because George Washington didn't particularly care about the Constitution. Um, he was an excellent military leader, but he just wanted to go home. He just wanted to chill in Virginia and hang out with his wife and like grow crops. The people who were really involved in the writing of the Constitution were much less powerful and a little bit less well-known. Uh, and you can see several other really important historical figures sort of raising their hands, arguing, generally being present. But I want you to notice that, number one, there's a lot of really important people gathered together here in this portrait. Um, and number two, they're wearing an extraordinary amount of clothing and wool and wigs for Philadelphia in the summer. So it's possible that one of the reasons that they finished a draft and then all went home immediately was because they were tired and they were hot. So the key ideas that they wanted to focus on in the Constitution are pretty basic, uh, but they're going to make a lot more sense to you at the end of the semester. So the first one, federalism. And that means that they needed to unify all of the states together into one big nation. That was really important because at the time there was a lot of argument about whether the states should be like their own separate entity, whether they should be almost independent kingdoms. And so one of the main things that they wanted to focus on was that sort of unification. Another one was representation. It was very important that people be allowed to vote. And again, here people has an asterisk. It's white men. It's landowning white men, but we'll get there. The third thing was the separation of powers. So like I mentioned earlier, one of the things that they were really trying to avoid was tyranny. Um, they had seen tyranny, they had seen terrible kings, and one of the things that they wanted to make sure of was that no one person could control the whole government. It's very specifically set up so that there's a separation of powers, there's a series of checks and balances, and basically no one person can like burn the whole thing to the ground. So. We'll talk about why, and we'll talk about where they got that idea, of course, over the course of the semester. But those are the things that I want you to keep in mind as we get started with the Constitution. So the Constitution starts, of course, with the preamble. And the preamble is very beautiful, so I am going to read it to you, even though I'm sure you have it memorized. There won't be a lot of walls of text, I promise, but there's a couple of things we need to read word for word because they're just so wonderful. So here's the preamble. We the people of the United States, and bear in mind, that part's very important. It is not me, the James Madison. It is not us, the Constitution Convention. It's we, the people. It's meant to be inclusive. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. So if you really look at this sentence, which it is just one long sentence, there's a lot of things going on here. And one is that they want justice. We're going to see a lot of that later, especially in regard to the court system. Two, they want tranquility. 
They don't want to be constantly at war, which was something that England was going through. They don't want to be constantly divided. They want to kind of chill and be peaceful and raise their babies. And that's what they're talking about when they talk about the blessings of liberty for our posterity. So posterity means your children and their children and their children. It's like the opposite of ancestors. And so one of the things that they wanted to do was promote the general welfare, which is basically make sure everybody's doing okay for themselves, but also for future generations down the line. So in this one sentence, we get a lot of information, and one is that it's pretty inclusive. Uh, the other is that they're concerned about everybody's welfare, and another is that they really want this thing to last. Uh, it's meant to be a document that can cover future generations for like hundreds of years going forward. So when we talk about the Constitution being a living document, it's important to remember that they really did design it to continue to live well after they were dead. So now let's get into Article 1. So Article 1 is about basically Congress. Uh, they wanted to start with the people who were going to make the laws. And one of the things that's really important to notice here about Congress is that they wanted a group of people to make the laws. They didn't put one person in charge of making the laws. They put a whole group in charge. And the group had to vote on each law. So that's important to remember as well, and we'll talk about that later. But the idea behind having a group of people make decisions is really, really crucial. So they went ahead and divided Congress into two groups. Uh, there's the House of Representatives and, of course, the Senate. And what they did was to make the qualifications for both groups a little bit different. Um, but as you probably noticed, the qualifications are not that strict. Uh, basically, if you want to be a member of the House of Representatives, you need to be at least 25 pretty young. You need to live there for, what, seven years? Not too bad. Um, if you want to be a member of the Senate, you need to be a little older. You need to be 35. Uh, you still have to have lived there for a certain number of years, nine years in this case. Um, and you do have to be a resident of the state that you represent. So the idea here was that there would be a lot of people in the House of Representatives. Uh, the House of Representatives is determined by the amount of people in your state, but there would only ever be two people in the Senate. So basically, they were creating like a hierarchical system. Um, at the bottom, the House of Representatives is made up of a lot of people. I don't think they ever realized how many people, but a lot. Uh, and then, of course, the Senate is like the, the next step up. You have to run things through the House and then through the Senate. And then at the top would be a judicial and an executive branch. So every time that you want to make a law, you have to kind of start big and work your way small. And again, that was intentional. They wanted a bunch of layers. They wanted a bunch of checks and balances. So they created these two groups who are responsible for like inventing laws, making them up in the first place, and then passing them. And then they invented a series of like escalations from there. So the powers that they gave to the Congress were pretty intense. Um, in large part, it has to do with laws, but it's also a lot about money. Um, they gave them the power to tax. They gave them the power to pay debts. They gave them the power to borrow money from other people. So basically, they didn't want one person in charge of all of the money, and they didn't want one person in charge of all of the laws. They wanted to sort of spread that out. So Article 1 is establishing Congress, because that was essentially the most important part to them. Article 2 is about the executive branch. So this is the part where we specify the president and the vice president and the electoral college. Uh, so we forget about the electoral college every four years it comes back and we remember and then we forget it again. And man, it's a mess. It's a mess. Um, when they established it, by the way, the people who made up the electoral college were just kind of whoever they wanted. There wasn't necessarily a system for getting certain people in place. It was basically, they thought, the most educated, whitest men would show up and pick the best president. So gradually we sort of changed our minds and we created a general population vote, but initially the president was to be chosen by a select group of men that they believed would make really good decisions. You can imagine how that went wrong. So, to be the president, there are a few qualifications, although really not very many qualifications are there, it's become increasingly clear. Um, basically, you have to be kind of old, you have to be 35. Uh, you have to be born in America. Again, they didn't want some sort of like random foreign tyrant to come in. They especially didn't want the British king to come in. That was very important. Um, and of course, you have to have lived in America for a pretty long time before you take over. But that's it. Uh, there are no educational requirements. There are no uh, wealth requirements. There are no voting requirements. Uh, there's certainly no like mental health requirements. Um, so basically, the person who gets elected president has to only follow some very short kind of minimal rules in order to become qualified to be president. The vice president was meant to be kind of a backup and also to break ties in the Senate. 
Um, so the Senate was designed to have an even number of senators. So in any time they had like a deadlock, the vice president would be the deciding vote. It's also worth noting that at this point, the second place person became the vice president. So the person with the most votes became the president, and the person with the second most votes became the vice president. And the idea was that the people liked the second place person second best, so what could go wrong? Um, a few terms in, they changed that to where the president and the vice president run together and they're part of the same party. But for a little while, again, it was built as a check and balance. The idea was that the person who was in second place might have different ideas than the person who was in first place, and forcing them to sort of argue about it and iron those things out would create a fairer playing field. Uh, again, we don't have that anymore, but here we are. So the duties of the president are not actually very extensive. Um, one thing that they really wanted, again, was to make sure that they didn't have a powerful monarch. They did not want an all-powerful tyrant. So the duties of the president are enumerated, but they're not super complicated. Uh, you know, they can choose ambassadors, they sign like bills into laws and that sort of thing. But the president doesn't have nearly as much power as sometimes we think that they will. Uh, the president is by and large a figurehead, and it was designed to be that way. Next, we have Article 3, and Article 3 is about the third big branch, which is the judicial branch. Um, so again, the Constitution was designed for really not that many people. At the time, there were still fewer than 3 million people uh, to be taken care of, so they really only established one court with possible future courts to come that would be below that court. Um, so they established one Supreme Court. How many people are on the Supreme Court, you ask? Trick question. They didn't say. It could be 50. It could be 3. It doesn't say. Uh, we sort of make that up as we go along. So basically the Supreme Court would take care of like all of the big cases and then they designed it so that there would be smaller courts going all the way down. We have a lot of those now. They also decided on a few key things. Uh, number one, in criminal cases, the person who is being charged gets a jury trial. And that's going to be important and we'll talk more about that later. But the idea again is that they want to avoid one person having so much power that they can be the judge, the jury, and the executioner. So they wanted to make sure that there was a layer between the person who was being accused and their death. Uh, and basically the way that they established that layer was to put a jury of your peers in the middle to decide your fate, which was very fair. And again, we'll go into more detail about that through the semester. The other thing they decided um, was that treason was bad. They were very worried about treason at this point in time. So again, the judicial branch was designed to make decisions. Uh, they were designed to provide a layer of protection for anybody who might be uh, unjustly accused, and they were designed to sort of level out the playing field between the other two branches. Next, we have Article 4. And Article 4 is mostly about the states, and it's mostly focused on sort of tamping down the power of the states and keeping them connected to each other. So basically in Article 4, it says that all the states have to respect each other's laws. Uh, basically, if you are guilty of a crime in one state, you're guilty of that same crime, even if you go to another state. Uh, that all of the states have to be a republic, which means that they can't like elect a king. Again, they were very concerned about the states breaking off into separate countries. Um, and that we can add new states if we feel like it. So one thing to remember is that there were so few states and they were all on one really defined side of America. America's really big, uh, and I think we forget that sometimes. Other countries are basically the size of Georgia, but America is just so gigantic that they did anticipate some spread. Um, so if you look at this map here, you can see that the states that are in dark red are the ones who were established when they were writing this, and the states you know, here to the west become added later and later and later as we go. So at the time, we were all pretty closely congregated over here, and it was a lot easier to keep people connected. It was a lot easier to keep the laws consistent. And one of the things that they were concerned with, with the fourth uh, article, was that we would have all of these states remain connected. So they said basically, yes, we can add new states, but they still have to be part of the federal government. Um, and yes, you can have a leader in your state, but it still has to respect the laws of the federal government. Basically, they wanted to make sure that each state could be separate and could have their own laws, but that there would be an ultimate overarching power, and that power would be federal. Next, we have Article 5. And Article 5 is one of my personal favorites because it's mostly about amendments, and it indicates that they knew this wasn't a finished document. 
they knew that they had sort of laid out the base, but that there was only ever going to be more stuff added on top. So basically, since they knew amendments were coming, they laid out a path to make amendments. And there's sort of two paths. Basically, you can call a convention or not. So if we look at this beautiful graph, you can see that one of the ways to do it is to sort of call a massive convention and get everybody together sort of on the spot. We don't really do that much anymore. The other way to do it is just to do it like while Congress is in session. So basically, there are two steps. Number one, you have to get everybody together to agree on the language. Uh, the language, very tricky. Lawyers, very concerned with this all of the time. Number two, you have to vote on it. So what they decided was that any time that you want to amend the Constitution, you have to have what's called a supermajority. Um, so that's why they wanted to put this in writing, because they wanted to make sure that you could change the Constitution, but also that you needed to have everyone agree to change the Constitution. Because again, they wanted to make sure that there wasn't one overarching power changing things in a way that the people didn't agree with. So this article was solely about how to change the document with an understanding that we were going to change the document. Article 6 covers kind of a lot of things, but its primary concern is that the federal government is more powerful than the state government. Essentially, federal law always overrides state law. And they had to be specific about this because, again, that was one of our biggest questions, whether the federal government was more powerful than the state governments. Another thing that's really interesting about Article 6 is that it specifies that members of Congress and really almost all uh, governmental employees have to take an oath of office. And the oath of office is very solemn and it's very serious, but lately it's come under some discussion because the last four words traditionally have been, so help me God. However, in the Sixth Amendment, it very specifically says that there will be no religious test. So that basically the people who are the members of Congress or are members of the Judiciary Committee or are the president don't have to be religious and don't have to pass a religious test. So the addition of these four words is very questionable, and they have decided recently that legally you are allowed to leave them out. So the oath says that you will solemnly swear to uphold the Constitution, but you no longer have to solemnly swear that God will help you, uh, which is pretty important, as we'll discuss in the First Amendment, which is coming up. The last article, Article 7, establishes how to make this document official. So basically, once they had finished the document and they had all voted that they liked it, they needed to make sure that all of the states were willing to ratify it. And there were 13 states at the time, but they only required nine to ratify it. And that's because it was not that popular. Um, a lot of people disagreed with some of the stuff that was laid out in the Constitution. A lot of people didn't like the wording specifically of certain parts of the Constitution. A lot of people just wanted to like nitpick little tiny parts. So in an effort to just like get it done uh, and get it over with, they decided that only nine of the 13 states had to ratify it. And even then, it took a pretty long time, um, in part because you had to like take the physical copy around to all the different states, and it took a long time to get to Georgia. Uh, but also in part because people were not super fans. So ultimately, of course, it did happen. Um, but the seventh article is basically outlining how to like make the Constitution official. Almost immediately after they finished the Constitution, they realized that they had left a bunch of stuff out. So basically what happened was they all went home, they went out and ratified the Constitution in all of the different states, but they sent James Madison home to do all the work, because again, somebody always does all the work. Um, and he wrote the first ten amendments, which are collectively called the Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights is basically all of the stuff that they kind of wanted to put in the final document, but they hadn't done yet. So essentially, the Constitution itself is a, just a scaffold. Uh, it's just like the, the bare bones of what we need to get a, a government and a country up and running. The Bill of Rights is sort of what goes on top of that. It's like all of the rights that they want to make sure that they include, even though they forgot them the first time around. So the Bill of Rights was sort of all written and all ratified in one big lump uh, in 1791. And basically, it includes a lot of the things that we think are most important about America. So let's get started with everybody's first and most favorite, the First Amendment. So the First Amendment is complex. It contains a lot of stuff. Most of the other amendments are kind of chill. They have like one thing at a time. But the First Amendment covers a lot. So it starts with religion. Um, and the thing that's important about this very first clause is that it sort of exemplifies two sides of the same coin. So essentially, the government can't force you to be religious, but neither can the government force you not to be religious. So what it says verbatim is, 
uh, that Congress can make no law respecting an establishment of religion, which means that they cannot make an overarching federal religion. They cannot insist that all Americans follow the same religion. Other countries do that, but they wanted that to not be a thing. Nor can they prohibit the free exercise thereof. So essentially, they also can't stop you from practicing whatever kind of religion you want. And this is going to be important later on. The second thing um, is that it will not abridge your freedom of speech. And what this means is that the government can't stop you from saying something. Another person can stop you. Your company can fire you from saying something. A private entity can always ask you not to say something. But the government can't stop you. They can't put you in jail for saying something. It is important to remember nobody is obligated to listen to you. Uh, a lot of people get really upset about their First Amendment rights, and it's important to remember that you can say stuff and the government can't put you in jail, but nobody has to listen to you and nobody has to agree with you. You're just allowed to talk. The next thing, of course, is the press. You can write down whatever you want and publish it. The government cannot put you in jail for that. They cannot make that a criminal offense. Again, your company can fire you if you put like a racist thing on Facebook, but the government can't do anything to you. So the press can say a lot of things about the president. They can say things about the Congress. They can say things about the Judiciary Committees. Basically, what they wanted to do was to make sure that, again, no tyrant could enforce complete silence among the people. So the freedom of the press means that they can say things that you disagree with and you can't like charge them with a criminal act. Again, very important. Um, the next thing is the right of people to peaceably assemble. And that's going to come up over and over uh, in the readings that we look at this semester, because basically one of the things that we know is that if a bunch of people get together, one of the things they might do is overthrow the government. Um, so throughout time, there have been a lot of laws about not having more than nine people or more than 12 people together in the same place at the same time, because that's how revolutions get started. Uh, so one of the things that they wanted to make sure was that Americans would be allowed to gather in groups whenever they want, especially in regard to like political uprisings, which again, so relevant, who knew? Uh, the final thing is that you can petition the government for a redress of grievances. And essentially the way that that's worked out in modern America is that you can sue the government. Um, so if the government, for instance, passes a law that you disagree with, literally you can sue the government. Uh, you can petition for redress, which means that you can officially file a grievance. You can officially say like, no, I don't think you should do that. And that's very powerful. Um, not a lot of countries give you the right to like stand up to your government in a really serious, legal, like precedented way. Um, so the fact that they put that in the First Amendment is also very impressive. So the First Amendment has most of our favorite stuff, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to protest. It's all there. And it's interesting, I think, this is the first thing they thought of that they needed to correct. So the Second Amendment is the subject of much discussion, especially lately. And the real problem with the Second Amendment is that it's a really messy sentence. Uh, it just doesn't make a lot of sense, and it has a bunch of weird commas. So let's go through and read it, and then sort of talk about what it might have meant. So what it says is that a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. So the question here is whether there's supposed to be a militia that has a bunch of guns or people who have a bunch of guns. It's sort of unclear. Um, a lot of people think that what it meant was that there should be a militia in each town and they sort of collectively own guns and keep them one place together. That is what we used to do. Um, guns were, and still are, expensive and difficult to make. So it used to be that like the government or the town would own guns and you would sort of borrow them. The question is whether we ever meant for people to have guns in their houses. And you could argue that we did, because it does say the right of the people to keep and bear arms. But there's some question whether it means that there should be a militia that is allowed to oppose the governmental army, or whether there should just be people with guns who can then form a militia. So part of the problem with the Second Amendment is that it's a messy sentence. The other part of the problem with the Second Amendment is that guns are way different now. So in regard to it being a living document, this is one of the parts that we continue to argue about. The Third Amendment is actually pretty simple. It says that the government cannot force you to house and feed soldiers. So it used to be a thing uh, that when you were at war, the government could essentially demand uh, that you let soldiers into your house and that you give them a place to sleep and you give them some food and you let them like shower. Um, that was how we fed and clothed soldiers back in the day, because we didn't have like a reserve, like a national reserve of food and uniforms and guns and that sort of thing. 
But one of the things they wanted to do away with was this thing where strangers came and slept in your house, so they made sure that we couldn't do it. Basically, you can't force people to let soldiers into their houses, not when you're at war, not when you're at peace. The Fourth Amendment has also been getting a lot of attention lately. So the Fourth Amendment basically says the government can't just come in your house and take stuff. Um, especially they can't come in your house and take stuff if they suspect you of being guilty of a crime. So basically for members of law enforcement or any aspect of the government to come into your house, they have to have a warrant. And to get a warrant, they have to prove probable cause. So what it says literally is um, that the people need to be secure and their persons, houses, papers, and effects. Lately, effects have been understood to be digital, like they can't get into your computers. Um, and that you cannot violate them unless you have a warrant and you can't get a warrant without probable cause. So basically, if you are a member of law enforcement and you want to go into somebody's house to search their stuff, you have to prove to a judge that you're pretty sure they're doing something wrong. Um, this is crucial because, again, it means that the government can't just decide that you're some sort of dangerous terrorist and come into your house, plant evidence, find evidence that's suspicious, and then kill you on the spot. Again, that used to be a thing. It's still a thing in other countries. So what this says is that basically you have the right to personal property. You have the right to be safe in your house. You have the right to keep all your stuff there. And the government can't come in and just rifle through your stuff and take it unless they have a really good reason to suspect that you're up to something. The other thing that's important is, of course, the warrant. Um, typically, it's kind of difficult to get warrants. You really have to prove that there's probable cause. You have to prove that you want to search a specific place and for specific things. And so this is very important because one of the things that's really unusual about the American governmental system and the Constitution itself is that it protects the rights of the accused. Very often, uh, when we design governmental systems, we protect the rights of the accuser, or we protect the rights of the people who are already in power. But what this document does, and again, this amendment specifically, is protect the right of the powerless. So basically, we are enforcing the right of somebody to have private property and to not have a tyrannical government come in and, and go through your stuff. And this is unusual, and again, as the, over the course of the semester, we'll read about why they thought that might be so important. The Fifth Amendment is pretty complicated, but again, it's mainly focused on the rights of the accused. So I'm going to go through and kind of read the different parts and explain them because it is a big old paragraph. Uh, so basically, it says that no person shall be held accountable for a capital or otherwise infamous crime um, unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury. And what this means is that they cannot have a really serious case, uh, especially a case that might involve the death penalty, without a jury. This means that if you are accused of, being, of doing something really quite serious, you deserve a jury. You have the right to a jury. And again, they wanted to put a layer in place between the accused person and the powerful people just to make sure that someone who was wrongly accused had a layer of protection. The next part um, says that this doesn't count for people who are in the land or naval forces. We didn't have an Air Force or a Space Force yet. Um, so basically, the military solves their own crimes. Uh, they have their own court system, which is kind of problematic. Uh, but basically, if you commit murder while you're part of the military, it doesn't really count as murder, and you don't have a murder trial. So the military handles its own court stuff. Nor shall any person be subject to the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. So this is the double jeopardy clause. Uh, basically, it means that if you commit a crime, you can't be punished twice for the same crime. So like if you rob a store and you go to jail, when you get out of jail, they can't be like, we're still mad about that and try you again. So basically, once you are tried, it stands, you can't be double tried. If you do have a court case, um, you do not have to testify against yourself. You can, um, and you may see this occasionally, where the lawyers for the defense choose to have the person testify, but you cannot be compelled to testify against yourself. Um, you will have witnesses. So basically, the people who are doing the accusing can bring witnesses who say that you did what you did or not, but you have the right to bring your own witnesses too. So again, that's crucial, because in these sham trials that we saw happening a lot at the time, and which do still happen, um, very often witnesses will be brought from one side only, which creates a really lopsided sort of system. So they wanted to make sure that you, as the defendant, could bring your own witnesses. Also, uh, you get due process.
So this part is crucial. The idea of due process is crucial. It's one of our most important American values. But what it says in the amendment is that you cannot be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process. You cannot just kill somebody for no reason. You cannot just take somebody's stuff for no reason. It doesn't matter who you are. Even the president can't do this. If you accuse someone of a crime, they get due process. And due process includes a trial, it includes a jury, it includes a court case, it's a whole thing, we'll talk about it. But basically every single person has to be treated with fairness under the law. It's a very American thing, and it's a really, really crucial thing. It's something we're struggling with, we'll talk about it. The last part um, says that private property cannot be taken for public use without compensation. So basically the government can't just like bulldoze your house and put up an interstate. Um, they can, but they have to pay you for it. Uh, basically, if it's your private property, the government can't take it. Uh, no matter if they want to do some sort of like innocent private property thing, or if they want to do some sort of like evil private property thing. Either way, if you own it, the government can't take it without paying you for it at the very least. The Sixth Amendment really gets into due process. And there's a lot of stuff going on in this amendment, but it's all really important because, again, it's about the right of the people who don't have power. So what we're going to do is kind of read through, and I'll tell you what they had in mind for each part. So the first part says that the accused gets a speedy and public trial. And the idea here is that you can't just put somebody in jail and, like, let them linger there forever. You kind of can. Guantanamo, we'll talk about it. But theory, in theory. Uh, once you are accused of a crime, your trial should follow really quickly afterwards. And also, it should be public. Uh, the idea here was that you can't just like have a trial at midnight while everybody's asleep and decide the person's guilty and kill them. Again, that used to happen. Um, so with having a speedy and a public trial, you were trying to guarantee as much justice as possible because other people would be watching. Speaking of which, you get an impartial jury. That part's been tough. People are not impartial, just as humans, we all carry bias. But the idea is that if there's enough people, the odds of it being impartial are a little bit higher. And also, the jury has to come from the place where the crime was committed. And the idea here is that crime sort of hit differently in different places. Uh, for instance, I don't know a lot about agricultural crime. I might not know how bad it was if somebody stole somebody else's corn seeds. But in an agricultural place, they would know. So the idea is that the jury comes from the place where the crime was committed so that it's personal to them and so that they have a certain amount of knowledge that they might not otherwise have. Next, um, you have the right to be informed of the nature of the accusation. So essentially, you can't just try somebody for a crime they don't even know about. Uh, you can't try somebody for a crime they don't understand. You can't try somebody for a crime that wasn't illegal at the time. Um, so basically, the idea here is that they have to tell you what your crime was. It seems basic, but trust me, they had to write that part down. The next is that you will be confronted with witnesses. Um, and again, the idea here is due process. You're going to get enough people together with the same story, it makes it look more true. So you get witnesses who are going to speak against you, but again, remember, you get your own witnesses as well. Speaking of which, you have a compulsory process for obtaining witnesses, and that is what a summons is. Um, basically, they had to establish a way that if you wanted a specific witness, they had to come. Um, and this was important for people who were trying to defend their rights. They, they needed specific people to show up and say the things. Also, those witnesses have to tell the truth. There has to be a place where we tell the truth. That place is on the witness stand. So again, the right of having a fair trial is, is here, is being protected here. They're trying to think of all the things. The last part is especially important, which is counsel. So that means that if you want a lawyer, you can have a lawyer. Um, you've probably heard the Miranda rights being yelled at people as they're getting arrested. If you do not have a lawyer, one will be provided for you. So the idea with the entirety of the Sixth Amendment is that if somebody is accused of a crime, we want their trial to be as fair as possible. And we're going to put a lot of things in place to make it that way. Amendment 7 is a little bit confusing because in reality it's not about $20 at all. But what it says is that you can't have a jury trial unless it's about more than $20, which would be about $375 in today's money, but really you don't get a jury trial unless it's like $75,000. Um, the important thing about the Seventh Amendment is that you can't try the same case twice. 
So what it really means is that if you have a court case and you don't like the verdict, you can't go to another state and have it tried again. You can escalate. Um, you can you know, try for a retrial or you can go to the next highest level of courts. But essentially, once a jury verdict is determined, you can't go back and change it. And specifically, the judge cannot go back and change it. So even if the judge doesn't like what the jury came up with, once a jury decides, it's done. The Eighth Amendment is also the subject of much discussion. Again, it's focused on the rights of the accused, but we have been arguing about what this amendment means for decades, and we're going to keep arguing about it for decades, basically. It says that excessive bail shall not be required. But what is excessive? Excessive to a rich person? Excessive to a poor person? We don't know how much is excessive. It also says excessive fines can't be imposed. Again, how much is excessive? Should it be based on income? Should it be one standard fine for everybody? And the final part says that no cruel and unusual punishments shall be inflicted. And again, we don't know what this comprises. Like, for instance, the death penalty. For a long time, we hung people. Then we decided that that was cruel and unusual, so we started shooting people. And then we decided that that was cruel and unusual, so we started electrocuting people. Cruel and unusual. Then we started injecting people. Cruel and unusual. We don't even know. We change our minds a lot. So again, one of the points of the document is that it's meant to be a living document, and we're allowed to sort of change what we think things mean over the course of time, especially as public opinion changes. But with an amendment like this, we do get stuck on what these adjectives mean. Um, what is excessive? And so that's a part that can be a little bit confusing, and that's why this amendment is very often debated in the courts. Article 9 is also kind of complicated. It's one sentence, but what it means is still under debate. So basically what it says is that the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. So one thing that it means is that the rights that are included in the Constitution are not all the rights that you have. It's not comprehensive. There might be rights they haven't thought of yet. There might be rights they didn't write down. Basically, it means that there could be other rights uh, other than the ones that are here already. It also means that your rights can't infringe on another person's rights and that your rights can't infringe on your other rights. So this one can be a little bit complicated, but the important thing to remember is that, yes, there's more rights we haven't thought of yet, and also no one right is more important than any other right, especially when it comes down to individual people. The Tenth Amendment is also an acknowledgement that there might be stuff we haven't thought of yet. Uh, so the Tenth Amendment says, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So what this means is that if you want a new law, you can make it on a state-by-state -state basis. That basically the federal government does, doesn't have to make every single law. The states can make laws, those can be different from other states, and that basically the rest of the power does lie with the states to make their own laws. So we see this a lot uh, when people talk about states' rights. This is sometimes what they mean. Um, but basically it says that we don't have to get all of our laws from the federal government. The states can also make up the laws that they see fit. So that is the basic Constitution. That's all the articles and the first ten amendments. But of course there are more amendments. One of the most important things about the document is that it's meant to be a living document. It is meant to be amended as time goes on, as public opinion changes, as technology changes, and we have done that. Um, basically, we've amended it 27 times. Um, we come up with other amendments all the time. 33 amendments have been sent up for ratification, not all of them passed. Um, probably about 100 amendments a year are suggested by members of Congress, but We've done a few. Uh, we've made a few improvements to it over the course of time, and there's a lot of question now about whether we should do more, because it is an old document, and it was written for way fewer people in a much smaller area than we ever expected. It was also written primarily for educated white men, and that's not really what America looks like anymore. So how is it holding up? Not too bad, but there have been some very important changes. So let's talk about a few of the most important amendments so far. Although all of the amendments are important, I just want to talk about a few that have really changed the way that we think about ourselves and the way that we think about America. So the first one is the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery. So one of the problems with the Constitution was that when it was written, basically black people weren't considered people. Again, we've changed our minds about that. Or have we? We'll talk about it. 
But uh, the 13th Amendment was put in place in 1865 after the Civil War, and it says that, no, for real this time, black people are citizens. They can't be slaves. They get to vote. That didn't quite work, because as you can see in the 15th Amendment, which was put in place in 1869, we had to make clear that you cannot deny people the right to vote based on race. So everyone of every race is allowed to vote, can't decide based on race. The 19th Amendment, which went into place in 1920, said that you can't deny people the right to vote based on sex, because we forgot about women the first time around too. It's not a perfect document, it's a living document. Uh, so it wasn't until a long time later that we decided, oh yeah, other people are people. So since 1920, women are also allowed to vote. However, all the women, question mark? No, that part comes back up again later. The 18th and the 21st Amendments are very famous. Uh, the 18th Amendment said that you cannot make and sell alcohol anymore. The 21st Amendment said, ah, we changed our minds, let's bring alcohol back. The 22nd Amendment is kind of interesting. We didn't put in place how many terms a president could serve. So we were kind of open to tyranny again. So it wasn't until 1947 that we decided that no president can serve more than two terms. Finally, in 1962, we got the 24th Amendment, which prohibits a poll tax. And what that means is that they cannot charge you to vote. Um, technically, you can't be charged like a, a tax to vote, you don't have to take a test to vote, because what was happening was that they were trying to disenfranchise certain voters by making it really difficult or really expensive or nearly impossible to cast their vote. This is still a problem. Uh, we're going to talk about that a lot this semester, because voter disenfranchisement is a major topic in the news right now, but basically what they decided was that you cannot make it more difficult for some people to vote than other people, especially because the only reason you would do that would be unethical. So those are some of the amendments that I think are particularly good, but we can talk more about which ones you like and which ones you hate when we get together for discussion. So I hope you enjoyed your first ever video lecture, and I'm looking forward to talking with you about all of the things in the Constitution for the next two months.